lunch. Um, so welcome to Leading Agile Change. Uh, just to introduce Dave, uh, I know reasonably well. Uh, I know enough of him to have great respect for the topic and great respect for him as a coach. Uh, Dave is with Agile 42. They are a significant coaching organization in Europe. And we're fortunate that they're now growing here as well. Those few transitions that you've heard with many, many, many teams, those really large scale, significantly difficult transitions, this man has done it. So he's the one to ask really tough questions to. <laughs> and what I enjoy most about Dave, and I think you'll see it here today, is this topic. Um, so for me, the test of a good coach is do they use Agile in their lives, in their work? So do they walk the, uh, walk the walk? Um, so Dave, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks a lot, so the difficult thing of getting an introduction like that is the second time I get the introduction, I'll know whether or not I've lived up to expectations as to whether it's the same or it's uh, shorter and, and a little less uh, detailed. Uh, today you're going to learn a little bit about some of the experiences that I've had uh, working on large enterprise transitions. In particular, what I'm wanting to do here is introduce a tool that we've developed as a result of that, called Agile Strategy Mapping. Um, but before I do that, I'll just give you a bit of background to myself and a little background to the, the particular transition we were working on and um, what went wrong and drove us to develop this tool. So as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm not a local Vancouverite. Uh, and no, Agile Vancouver did not fly me over from the UK. Uh, I moved here a year ago, just over a year ago. Uh, I was actually, I left the UK 10 years ago. So I was living in Germany for eight or nine years uh, and moved here about a year ago. Uh, I uh, cut my teeth in Agile, if you like, with a previous company where as an IT director, we introduced Agile and as the saying goes, I liked the concept so much, I didn't buy the company, uh, but I joined the consulting company, Agile 42, that led that transition. Uh, having first successfully transitioned uh, the IT organization of 75 people, uh, most of whom were in Armenia and the company was in Germany. Uh, having made a successful transition there and about 18 months later, was able to step back as IT director, safe in the knowledge the IT organization was in safe hands and was delivering consistently and as you'd expect in ag any agile transition, incrementally improving and delivering working software on a regular basis. But first, a little bit about the story that I'm kind of coming here to talk about. So I'd like to talk a little about a, an agile transition that uh, a, a team of nine uh, international coaches came together for. It's, I, I don't think there's like details on what a large transition is, but it's one of the largest transitions certainly I've heard of working in the telecommunications industry. And, uh, what we were actually doing, we, we at that time worked in a business unit with 6,500 people uh, and after a bit of legwork laying the foundations for an agile transformation with a bit of work with a pilot team, uh, we brought together nine coaches, uh, that is CSC, certified scrum coaches, certified trainers, uh, as well as a handful of, of uh, experienced coaches but without the qualifications if you like or the, name, the, the letters behind their names to put together a transformation of over 500 individuals to 50 teams, which then has gone on, we built the internal capabilities so that uh, that organization now has 6,500 people have transitioned to Agile in the last two years, and then now extending that across other business units in this uh, organization, which has over 100,000 employees. So a little bit, I, I, the talk today is not how to do huge transformations. Uh, it's not focusing on the intricacies of there. What I want to focus on is some of the experiences we had in terms of kind of what went wrong. Uh, the first thing I want to look at here is just, this is just a quick summary to say 
setting the scene, the way where we started is we had these nine coaches, very experienced, all coming together to lead that transformation. Our objective was to build internal capabilities so that those, those that organization could continue with the agile transformation and build a sustainable and, and incrementally or continually improving organization. In order to do that, uh, each of the six countries involved sent along their what on paper should have been their best employees to create the internal coaches and scrum masters. So there were 23 people. So this, the, we, we then have the nine coaches, external coaches, 23 as an internal trans, transitional transformation team. And they would then be working with over 500 individuals to create these 50 teams. Uh, and the first thing we did was co-locate around eight teams together so that we could actually coach the internal coaches on getting off the ground. So that's setting the scene, that's what, where we're at at the moment. We're at the beginning or we're in that first couple of months when we're getting the internal coaches off the ground. And this is what we saw in terms of, the, uh, in terms of the, that organization. The, the agile teams themselves, everything was as you'd expect, everything went really well. They were really enjoying themselves, they were co-located, so many of them had been brought in. Uh, they were therefore socially getting on very, very well, beginning to form the relationships that you're looking for in good teams. Uh, separate to that, they're cross-functional, they're in the same place, they're beginning to focus on changing how they've been releasing things. Uh, the, the business need behind this organization's transformation is that they were delivering product over two year life cycles and their customers were being sold product that was changing in a three month life cycle by Chinese competitors. So they were absolutely against the wall, losing market share against these competitors. So their pressure to increase that time to market or decrease that time to market was substantial. So the Agile teams themselves, I've chosen a picture of the Jetsons there because it was all smiles, like a good cartoon, everything was going really well. The teams themselves, no problem at all, they started transitioning. Anybody who's been involved in a transition, we saw the, the, the things you expect to see, which is teams struggling with things, but as they're working together and becoming more self-organized and managed themselves, taking care of those problems and solving them within the teams a lot of the time. That team of 23 people, there's a few things that happened there. One of the first things is uh, that team was, had a, a wide range of individuals in it because some organizations hadn't taken the transition seriously and led uh, or, or, or suggested to the people they didn't really know what to do with that they may want to join this team. Other organizations, took this very, very seriously and placed their best people there. So we had a real mix, as you would expect in that team. And this time I chose a picture of Star Trek, and in particular I chose a picture of the individual there that none of us recognize. Therefore, we all know something horrible is gonna to happen to him. And in many cases, this team of 23 kind of went through that. So what I show here is the team's pretty large. We had a lot of people that really didn't know what they were doing there. They weren't clear what was going on. Uh, no real surprises in that, again, anybody who's seen as largish organizational changes, change creates difficult situations for people to adjust to. And some people can adjust to it, they have the time, they adjust and they go with it. They align with the new way of working. Other people really fight back. And we saw that a little bit, a few people fought back. Um, the stand-ups that we have within these 23 individuals and plus nine coaches, you've got 30 people there near enough. Uh, obviously, those weren't very productive. We solved it as you'd expect. You start seeing Agile at scale. We started doing things like Scrum of Scrums. We started breaking out teams. And overall, we're pretty happy with this. So as the external coaches looking at this, um, there's a few questions. There's a few individuals that people recognized and then disappeared as, as uh, the organization adjusted and realized how serious the, uh, organ the, the leadership was taking this transformation. But overall, everything went really well from a, an external coach looking in, being able to kind of polish off our badge and say things are going well here. So the only team left over is the coaches. And we're all external coaches. We've done large transformations before, small transformations. We're very experienced, so obviously there's no problems here at all. Um, unfortunately, this is where 
the situation that we found within the coaches kind of became the story. That's why I'm choosing Apollo 13. The story is not about the successful journey. The story is about the challenges that we had as a coaching team. And uh, for that reason, I'm not mentioning the names here for, for that reason, but they're very, very, uh, you know, uh, very experienced coaches that came together and we really struggled to find an effective way of working. And this is a little bit about the story of where, why that happened in particular, and then what we found as we incrementally moved forward and sat through our retrospectives, kind of staring at one another, thinking, how can this be happening? We should be able to, to walk the walk. We should be the ones who can work in an agile way. Why is it when we get together, we can't somehow work in an agile way? And uh, how we learned and, and moved around that. And there's a hint of what's going on. And there are two things I want to point out here. One is, as you would expect with nine coaches coming together, if there was a backlog item anywhere near a backlog, it got done. Because we're all about, we can, we can move backlog items. So there's a lot of that sort of, you know, that there was not a, an issue with getting workflow going through. So the workflow issue wasn't the problem. But what you can see there is the shared product ownership that we need in leadership teams, as I'll describe, was really slow in emerging. We struggled to come to terms with that uh, over the first uh, sort of six or eight weeks as we worked on this transition. <clears throat> so the conclusion, if you like, of my little story before I go on and give you the details, um, I, I think what really struck us as these agile coaches on this large transition was a couple of things. One, the first one is uh, you kind of walk out of that situation shaking your head and thinking, you know, yes, and just to let you know, it was a successful transition. We're still working with that organization. A number of the coaches keep going backwards and forwards. And in fact, we're just about to kick off a transformation in a completely different business unit in the next couple of weeks. So this transformation was, a, was definitely a success for the organization. And they, the, the company itself has just announced stellar results this year in the last two weeks. Uh, I'm not going to say that it's anything to do with the Agile transformation. I think it's a reflection of the, the uh, company itself and the leadership there. Um, but certainly, so things went well there. But we still felt, yeah, we should have done more. There's more we could have done. We could have done it quicker. We could have done something more. And the second thing that we were very acutely aware of is as Agile coaches, if we can't work in an Agile way, we've got a real problem being able to get other people to buy into the story that we're telling around Agile. So that was a real... Uh, eye-opener, if you like, for, for us on that transformation. <clears throat> Let me just see. Okay, so, um, and uh, what we did is we started, de you know, uh, retrospecting and, and looking into things. And what I did when I was preparing for this talk, I'm trying to look into what should we have known about this? Should, we, should it be something we could have uncovered beforehand? Uh, or is it something that's just a, you know, an indication of what's going on? And I want to talk now just a little bit about leadership teams and how the situation we were in was very different to many of the transformations that we see in other, um, or I've certainly seen in, in other cases, and many of the other coaches have. So we identified four different things. And uh, my purpose is I'm giving you a bit of background as to where the changes came from identify those four things and then we're going to break out into some sessions and actually create some uh, strategy maps which is the tool that we've ended up uh, iterating towards uh, that overcomes the challenges that we found. So of those four things, the, the first one is uh, probably relatively clear to anybody who's worked in startups or worked in organizations that grow very rapidly. This is uh, the Griner curve. It was first published I think in 1972. Harvard Business Review have taken it and published it every five or ten years just to show uh, that they're still interested in s small business growth, I, I guess. And very broadly, this is uh, time as the, as the uh, uh, company changes and grows. On, on the y-axis is the size of the organization. And of course, you can't put numbers there because that's going to vary depending on the industry. Um, <clears throat> But as a general rule, there are phases that any small organization goes through as they grow. One of the critical ones being uh, the phase one, two, three, and four on the top. Those are all leadership crises, things that happen to an organization 
that the company has to adjust the structure, how they work together and so on. Uh, and in particular, one of the, the reasons or one of the realizations we came to is because of the scale of that transition, because of the fact that we had nine external coaches and the way we worked is those coaches were effectively pairing up and working in different parts of the organization, working on different teams, but then we'd often swap in and out of other parts of those teams. So we had to make sure we were completely aligned with what we were telling those teams. Uh, we all had great understanding of agility, but the communication, that terminology had to be pretty consistent to avoid confusing people. And what we found is we went through that growth through direction phase, which is a traditional way of working. That is that as a coach, you're in a role providing clear direction to individuals in a coaching way, not a, not a, a, a command and control way, but you're directly involved with those individuals. And what we found is we've moved over to the delegation and coordination piece. And this is where things started falling apart, uh, was the fact that we had to change or, or the environment we're working in was no longer what we were used to. So I, if I was working with one coach and another coach came in, we had to find a way of reliably allowing these people to come into teams we'd been working with uh, without the risk of confusing the teams because if the teams were confused, we had a real problem. Now, although we were able to do pretty well when we were in front of the teams, what we then found when we went back to do our stand-ups and retrospectives and planning is that there was a lot of uh, misunderstanding and confusion as a result there. That's sort of that coordination and delegation piece. And, and uh, w one of the things to pick up is that only came about because of the scale of what we were doing. If we'd broken that down to smaller uh, or we'd chosen a different way of making that transformation, that would probably not have happened. The second point is is quite interesting actually and the more I look into this this is something that I think uh, we don't know enough about and we need to work more on and this is the idea that leadership is a is a group activity so typically when we're working with uh, management teams executive teams every you can tell by the body language who makes the decisions in the room you can see who calls the shots and it may not be the CEO uh, you can see who people defer to and who is driving a lot of the change there. When those individuals are out of the room, there's very little point in making uh, commitments and decisions because very often they will then go back past this individual. That's a, a situation that I've certainly, I'd, like, I'd say, grown up with in terms of my, my business career and that's what I'm used to. But more and more now, especially as you start working with agile teams, self-organized teams, and especially as you move up into that leadership role, you begin to see really highly functioning teams where there is no individual that commands that sort of uh, respect or demands that sort of respect. This here shows a couple of numbers from a, a paper, it's about 10, 15 years old now, but that was a summary of a lot of work that was done into groups and how groups work together. And what they were finding is that the top graph here in the blue is employee participation in leadership groups. And what you can see is, the, and, and this was a summary of about the last seven years, so sort of 1990s through 1990s. So this is the decade when everyone's talking about empowerment of employees. And you can see the number very clearly there. Employee participation in leadership groups jumps dramatically. Uh, and the same thing here, you've got self-managed work teams which was always already pretty strong is beginning to increase even more and it's just dominating that workspace which any of us uh, well sometimes we see this and I would say sometimes we don't so that was something that uh, really struck us and, and the, when reading through this paper the interesting thing is they talk about uh, this emergence of group leadership what I would say in in the last sort of five or ten years I still see that that emergence is not there and so I think that's one reason why when you actually find an organization or a group of people who are truly leading as a group where you don't have the one person that everybody is, is looking to to find out what the decision should be, uh, we, we actually struggle with it. And this is one of those things that we found. We had a lot of coaches. They all live and breathe servant leadership. So what we actually found for the first four weeks is everybody took a step back and wanted everyone else to have the floor and have a conversation. And what we found was we kept spinning our heels and spinning our heels until we found 
a methodology or a framework that we could all rely on to, to, to make decisions and make those decisions visible. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Uh, the third thing that we're looking at is the definition. From the same paper, they defined, they summarized a lot of different work, and they identified four different types of teams. Uh, one of the teams is the one that I kind of think is most teams, is the concept of working teams. These are the teams that do the work, obviously. Uh, they, they comment in here that this is more and more self-managed, at least on paper, is more and more self-managed teams. And uh, they're pretty well defined, they're full-time, they're always there, and they're committed to what's going on, they're stable. They identify two other types, that one of them, the parallel team, or the virtual team, uh, in some sense we use quite a lot in, in Agile, in some form, whether it's a, a technical architecture decision team or a, a quality team that's looking at one particular aspect of the whole product, but it will be a virtual team across multiple, multiple Agile teams. And in this particular case, those parallel teams typically are making recommendations. So, again, from our experience, we see parallel teams. We don't call them parallel teams, but we see parallel teams. We encourage and grow them when we're doing transitions. We see the work teams. That's what we want to see. Uh, as an agile coach, I can say when I see project teams, our focus is to move them to work teams and so that the projects flow through fixed work teams. But again, it's not unusual to see work teams. I challenge any Agile coach here to say that multitasking is the way to increasing uh, your time to market. Uh, maybe someone will tap me up on that, I don't know. Uh, I think that, I mean, that's quite an interesting topic on its own, it's just the idea that multitasking is the way to go forward is certainly dropped off the way of managing ourselves or managing organizations and teams. But the final point here is the leadership teams, and I thought this was quite interesting, that this was the first mention I'd certainly come across where the idea of a leadership team is truly different to the idea of other teams. And the idea of a leadership team or groups that are leading, uh, applying, can, the, the definition, I'm taking these definitions straight from the paper. I really like this definition, this integrating efforts, disparate efforts, the idea of sharing responsibility for success. All of these things are really uh, close to what we understood ourselves to be. As, and it took us a while because we thought we were a working team. And we behaved as we were, as if we were a working team, but actually, uh, as you'd expect with the coaches involved, we were quite an advanced leadership team by the time we realized what was going on. So here's my picture of the movement to show that working teams and leadership teams are two ends of the same animal somehow. Uh, the point of leadership teams is, uh, and, and I think maybe I'll spend a bit of time trying to explain the difference. Well, as we looked at this, as we look back, what we recognized with the working teams typically we're trying to get product ownership outside of the teams. The working teams are execution teams. They make decisions within the scope and the, the area that they're working in, uh, but they do not not having to make prioritization decisions. That's outside of that working team. Uh, they tend to be dedicated in the sense that they are 100% there. It's very, even if you've got somebody bouncing in and out between different execution teams, that individual is probably moving from one working team to another to another. Perhaps some of those parallel teams as well. And uh, I think importantly, they, they do the work. They're cross-functional in, in an ideal situation, but they're also they're doing the work. And it's, uh, it, this comes to that estimation question. Estimating by people who aren't doing the work never has this, the right result. You need to get things like estimation done by the working team, by the team doing the work. Uh, in the same way, what we recognized as characteristics of leadership team, and these are the problems that we have to solve. The first one is this uh, idea of internal and shared product ownership. Because uh, if you have one CEO or CXO who's driving the behavior of a leadership team, you effectively have an external product owner. That product owner happens to be in the team, but if I have a question about prioritization, about what we should do next, I know exactly who to go to. In the stage where you've got a leadership team, which is truly a group working together, uh, maybe on a community, a volunteer group, committed to a, a community activity or community building exercise, for example, then the product ownership becomes both internal to the leadership team and is also shared across the leadership team. 
The second point is it's very rare that the leadership team is truly dedicated. They often have many other pulls on their times. They're probably a division director or some, they have an organization that they are responsible for managing, for leading, and for solving all of the problems that come out of it. Um, they're cross-functional in that I have a director of operations, I have a director of development, customer service, marketing, and so on. However, they're not doing any of the work. They're immediately going to delegate what's going on. So in that case, in that situation, it can be quite difficult because they're making commitments or they may feel they have to make commitments for things that their teams can't actually, uh, they don't know if their teams can support it. And um, one of the other things that we picked up is very often leadership groups, uh, because of the habit of managing by exception, the leadership groups only deal with exceptions. And uh, this means that their ability to commit, their ability to turn up for a regular stand-up is greatly affected. And it's very common for you to lose individuals in a, in a leadership team for weeks at a time as they're dealing with exceptions, as they're dealing with something in their organization. And then they have to come back and somehow catch up with where things are. The final point I'll touch on, and this is a, kind of a, a, in some ways a, a bugbear of mine, which is the idea that tools really do drive behavior. So in this particular case, I've just used the hammer and the nail. If I have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, it certainly limits me to carpentry, let me put it that way. Uh, the, the idea of a lot of leadership tools is it's reinforcing uh, non-good leadership behavior. I'm try, probably trying to put that in a better way. Um, let, it, it's really interesting. This, um, 10, 15 years ago, when I used to get involved with strategy as some young newbie joining the leadership team, very excited. Every time I saw one of these diagrams, my chest would puff out because I'd go, I'm here. I'm, I'm running this pillar, or I'm responsible for this. It was something that was very, you know, was, was one of those things that, that I'd finally made it because I'm somehow involved in the strategy pillars and the strategy house. Nowadays, I, I shun it like a plague. And I, I've developed my, I've developed this for many companies that I've worked with. I've been part of this process many times. I struggle with it nowadays because of the behavior it drives. Um, and, and partially because it's everywhere. I've done a quick search on it. The, the Canadian, MI5, I'm in the UK, MI5, Internal Canadian uh, Security Services has their own pillar diagram. This is the one for the Canadian military. Um, so they're really everywhere and they're, they're kind of part of the fabric. Racing diagrams, all of these different things. These tools, the challenges with them is they drive leadership teams to a certain way. Um, they tend to be, uh, let me just look through the notes here. They, the challenge with leadership nowadays, as, as organizations have flattened, is you need a, a view across the whole organization. And a lot of these tools cut that organization into pieces and then say, look, you're responsible for whatever it might be, this piece. You don't need to talk to the other pillars. And that sort of chopping things up, into, into chopping the, the value stream, if you like, into independent pieces, is very, uh, drives a lot of very odd behavior. <coughs> Examples here, so my picture of the nut that has been cracked open and is in pieces. A lot of those silos end up with a local optimization of effort, local optimization of results. A director who manages the quality organization is going to be measured, rewarded, challenged to change, optimize, and so on. Only that one pillar, whatever that might be. That tends to lead, as I show here, to silo behavior, this negative reinforcing loop. If I've got silo behavior and I'm in a, a management team where everybody has this silo behavior, then I'm going to start making vague commitments because all of our, my reward, my, my career growth, if you like, is on meeting commitments. And as long as nobody knows my area of expertise and I can kind of pull the wool over people's eyes or just I look at behavior around me, I'm going to live, get vaguer and vaguer commitments. There's even a problem because the guy in the silo next to me is not going to call me out, even if he knows or she knows that I'm kind of covering something up. Because if some finger points at me, they know that I can point the finger back. 
So this behavior there that leads to vague commitments, weak accountability, and continues to drive that. And, and again, anybody who's been in this situation or works with uh, large transformations, this becomes a real barrier to change. And uh, the positively reinforcing loop, and I think this is one of those things that when people say to me, what's the first thing that you do in an organization? One of the first things I do is just visualize the whole process end to end and find a number, a metric, something I can measure that deals with delivery outside. Because the number of organizations I know that optimize in their, those pillars is phenomenal. So again, no, no big surprises here. If you're looking at the whole value chain or if you're looking at delivering out to the customer, you begin to get shared ownership. And the strategy map that we'll show you in the, in the next 50, 45 minutes or so, uh, that strategy map that delivers this visualization, vi greatly visualizes it, has, has changed leadership teams and how they, the dynamic that they have in them. Which is one of the reasons why uh, we like using this so much. It leads to definite commitments because we kind of have to get results. And uh, if anybody's uh, working with them in a lean or agile way, they're going to be getting small definite commitments. And of course that increases the accountability in the organization. So next steps, the things that we learned, now we're much more aware when we're working with large transformations about whether or not we're working with working teams or leadership teams. So we're looking for the scale, where are we in that Griner curve, if you like, uh, in terms of how we're working. And we're also looking uh, at things like uh, what sort of team are we working with? Is this a leadership team or a working team? And adjusting our behavior accordingly. And the second thing, in terms of focusing on those negative loops, what we'll talk about in a second, is tools that allow us, and, and this was the reason I'm bringing the pillars in. Instead of the pillars, we're now working on much simpler visual tools that allow the whole organization to sit around it. We've worked with leadership teams on creating these a lot, and uh, that focuses on transparency and the end product, rather than uh, silo behavior. So this is where I'm going to ask you to get a bit more involved, uh, rather than kind of sitting back and waiting for the end. Uh, this is a, is a snapshot of uh, one of the strategy maps we recently created with a client. The agile strategy mapping is an idea of getting that connection between where the transition is trying to go, where the leadership team is trying to go, and how the leadership team is getting there. Making it visual so that we can solve that problem of sort of uh, diffused product ownership. And in these, what we find with these uh, the strategy maps, as you'll see, is that as a leader, as a, a, a participant in that, every time I come to the map, I can see where I need to work. And if it's in my area, great, I'm going to pick something up and work on it. If it's not in my area, I at least know to go to that director, that, that organization, and say, what can we do to help you before we turn to our activities ourselves? So as I say, the Agile Strategy Map is grown. And I should have given the introduction on this slide. The Agile strategy map is really is generating teamwork and generating questions. So we really like this because you can put it up on a wall and it's just something that even as people walk by, it's going to lead to the right sort of behavior. Uh, it allows for all of the exceptions, the changes in strategy, the changes in direction that organizations have to live with and manage on a daily basis. Uh, and it really sort of prevent some of the difficulties that I have with this particular, um, uh, the framework that I've shown at the bottom of the pillars. So the strategy map itself, give you a bit of background, where it started when we're struggling with this situation in our uh, organization, we started off leaning on theory of constraints and the, uh, and <coughs> what you can see here is the IO map, the intermediate objectives. Basically we're starting, and we'll do this now, we'll start with an objective and we're looking, in, the, in this case, in TOC, we're looking at only the critical success factors. What we found is that was too limiting because the, the problem with the critical success factor is as soon as you find you can't move forward on it, on paper at least, you should throw that strategy away and start again. Because if it's truly a critical success factor and you can't move it forward, you can't unblock it, it means the strategy that you're working on is going to fail. So what we actually found is we move towards possible success factors. We try and broaden our opportunities there. And then we can adjust our strategy as we find different ones of those success factors are blocked. 
The final point that you see at the bottom is necessary conditions. Anyone who's familiar with this, the necessary conditions is saying, okay, for that one success factor, what are the things I have to get done in order to deliver on that one success factor? And here we do want necessary conditions. Because if we just brainstorm every idea we can think of, we end up working and working and working, but not actually getting anything necessarily that's going to meet our objective. So, as I said, we would start with the objective. I don't want to spend too long on describing how we're getting the objectives there. That's sort of a, another exercise. Um, one of the things I would say is what we find really valuable is if a team comes up with a strategic objective and then kind of sits down and says, there we go, we're going to be the best X in the world, which is typically what you end up with, what we're immediately going to follow up is say, that, that sounds great. Uh, What's it going to look like in six months? Well, it depends on the industry, but say six months or a year. You've got there. You're on the way towards your objective. What does it feel like? What does it look like? What has changed? And we're using that to define the metrics that we're going to then move towards. So the advantage there is we allow somebody to go and be, you know, cloud nine. This is where they're going to be. It's going to be this wonderful experience. Our customers will just give us money for being in the same room as them. Uh, but then we're saying, okay, let's bring this down to reality and say, come on guys, in six months time, how does your work environment change? And then we'll try and figure out how we can measure that. So the next thing we're going to do is, is brainstorm out and these possible success factors. And uh, we've, what I'm going to ask us to do now is break into groups of sort of five, six, seven, eight people. Uh, and uh, we've got whiteboards around, I've got this one here. There's pens and paper and so on. And what I wanted to do is take the, ex the example of starting with an objective and blowing out some success factors and necessary conditions. So to give you an idea of what success factors are, uh, they tend to be quite broad because you're not going into defining an action. They tend to be skills or capabilities that you need to deliver the objective. They can be relationships that you have to build, networks, communities, connections that you have to make, uh, or they can be constraints, targets, some sort of a, a, an objective in its own right that you're going to have to achieve. So again, what you can see, for those who can read at the back, this is actually a strategy map that we developed for another uh, transition that we've done. Uh, so you can use that as some ideas, and I'll walk around and help out if you have questions. Uh, here's, uh, and I've also suggested an objective here. But the other thing you can do, especially if you're working or you, you find a group of people who are kind of working in a similar area, is you can spend a few minutes and come up with your own objective. Okay? So I, I'd like to suggest we take a, spend the next 10 minutes doing this, of so breaking into teams of five or six people, get together, introduce yourselves, get a little bit of a feeling. The first thing you want to do is, is this objective as an agile community uh, that offers uh, those interested in Agile experiences and practices a place to learn about Agile and meet other like-minded practitioners and enthusiasts. That's our objective. If you don't want to use that as an objective, you can come up with your own. I actually wanted to write one up here that could be a successful Agile transition of five teams uh, in the next six months, something like this. That could be a nice objective as well. Just agree what that objective is first and then, as a group, brainstorm the success factors. Okay? An idea on the brainstorming, what I find works really, really well is, or let me say two things. First thing is, what doesn't work really well is, if one of us says, that's the objective, what's the next success factor? Because then everybody's going to just sit quietly and wait for somebody, especially since we're all agilists, as I said, nobody's going to take the lead. So an alternative that works really well is if everybody gets four or five stickies and a pen and you give yourself one or two minutes just to write what you personally think are success factors for that and then gather them all up and you can then do dot voting or some form of prioritization but you at least get everybody's ideas out in the open. So as I say, there's uh, boards here behind the pillars. We've got uh, paper and stickies here. Anybody who needs a pen, let me know. And uh, I'll walk around the groups and just doing that. We're going to try and bring, bring out a strategy map. Okay. Do 
Doug from Agile 42. Oh, All right. <laughs> so we know who's leading this thing. Yeah. <laughs> know that if you know the community will be really successful if you had it you've got no intention of doing it you could say they should have a yacht yeah, it's nice to have but it's just not going to happen right now but then we're open to the idea that's an outcome of a successful group yeah they have less money than they can buy in yeah yeah so then then the question is which is more important so which comes first if you like is it that the organization has lots and lots of money, which means that should be a success for The outcome being they can buy it. Or is it that they want a meeting place where it's private, you know, it's something like that. So we've got to understand a bit more about what's there. Yeah. On 40 success factors, because you can't focus on that. You want about 8 to 10. Yeah, okay. Like and they come up with a new topic about that. Yeah, you might circle them and say, okay, this relates right. to X. Yeah, yeah. So, so you may have to squeeze it a bit in some way. Yeah. How are we doing on the success factors? Grouping them up or have you done those? Yeah. We haven't done it. I think we almost did. Instinctively by adding. Yeah. So you kind of grouped it in the most. And there's, there's like one. So we're trying to figure out uh, after getting a bunch of stuff on the top what is uh, how do we really look at uh, defining a success factor? How do we actually pull that out of this? Because maybe we didn't get the right things. No, that's a great question. So the thing to start is in order to start an online easy, what is critical. What are the building blocks like these success factors? You're going to have to have those online, but online presence, yeah. but editorial stuff. You know, the community. They're the success factors that I've got a community. What we tend to have, yes. Yeah. So it's a really high level of abstraction. Um, they, 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 you're going to define it. So what typically happens is if we say, oh, well, we need a community. You're going to actually probably break down a community. You need a community of people who you need another community of people who need to contribute to it, edit it, it. So you end up separating it. We've done this for um, open source projects. And you can imagine from a community site, they need very different types of communities. Support, development, users. So that gives you a kind of part of it. But then you go into other parts, other types of industry, and they don't have it, they just need a community of customers. Because that's not critical to what they do. That's why it's quite difficult to see the success factor tends to come out of what your objective is always. 
what's important to one company in terms of community. That, that's great because now your necessary conditions to say, how do I get a million subscribers? I need 10 million people visiting, I need this. I mean, so that's, that's exactly the, the more specific you can define a success factor, the more likely you're going to get some value out of it. So your first instinct was right that it is something that measures the success. It's not the factor that's going to contribute to achieving that measure. It contributes to the success, but hopefully it is measurable. So I, I do see situations where you're a success factor. We just had this conversation of pleasure. You end up with a success factor. Nobody has a clue how to do it. Um, maybe it's, uh, okay, we, we need to open up in the Asian market. We, we don't have a presence there, we've got no clue, there's no budget for it, we're not going to do it, but it would allow us to get there and it's sort of something we're thinking about. But then you're just not going to put any effort behind it until one of your other success factors kills off for whatever reason, and then you go, this is the only way for That's that we need to go. Or it's like your factors. Yeah. Like you, you, you don't have loads of them. It tends to be an idea that you, you know, that project, a hot potato, people keep thinking about. Uh, one company we had, it was China. We must be in China. So everybody keeps saying that. Every management meeting, we must be in China. So they put it up there, and then it dropped off the management meetings because everyone's like, yeah, we're not going to do it now. Again, a minute or two just to pull them together. They're already And uh, what we would do next would be to take every success factor and get a sentence behind that success factor that defines it in the context of that business. So they define it in a way that everybody who's involved says, now I know what you're talking about there. I, I get it and, and, and we can, I buy into it. Uh, what I'm going to ask you to do now is take one of those success factors that you have, write that one sentence as a group, and then now do your necessary conditions. Now the necessary conditions, the, 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 there's two step, steps to this if you like. Um, the first step of your necessary condition is you're just going to brainstorm every action you need to do to deliver that success factor. What are all the ideas you can get out that needs to deliver that success factor? Then you want to take that lean startup approach of, okay, I've got 25 things here that could deliver, that could all contribute to that success factor, but what are the only things that have to be there, the necessary conditions? So again, do your brainstorming, get all the ideas in the open, but then this time, within that group, really kind of challenge each one and say, if we didn't have this, would the, we still have that success factor? Would we get there? And if the answer is no, you keep it. If the answer is, yeah, we would, you throw it. If the answer is maybe, think about it, but you're probably going to throw it anyway. So, and then you should end up with your next steps needed to get that success factor. Now, in some cases, there'll be actions that somebody could say, oh, I can go and do this register or subscribe to a magazine. Great, I can do that. Some cases, they'll ha you'll have to go and do another level of breakdown to get to an actionable item. Your goal today is not to have all of the actionable items. So think of it as brainstorming the necessary conditions or projects that you would have to complete in order to get your successful. <coughs> okay? I'm going to try, I noticed we kind of overran on time because I didn't swing by here enough. So I'm going to keep this one a bit shorter. I'd suggest around like eight minutes and I'm going to time it this time and close it and we can close the conversation that we're having today. Okay? I'll walk around any questions, but eight minutes from now. Yeah. saying, okay, if your cultural change is, I guess the scenario is you currently deliver every six months, you want the organization to be focused on delivering every three months, and everybody goes, yeah, that's it, that's your cultural change, because then I can think, what are my necessary conditions, I need 
the technical environment as well. So to do that in smaller chunks of work, probably you need you can't be releasing every three months because it can be disaster. You probably release every month internally, and then drop it every three months. So then those become the necessary conditions around that. And when you meet all of those, you meet that. Okay. So that sentence is fine. It may be completely different to the next organization. Their idea of cultural change, the organization I work with today, their idea of cultural change is about the way they work. They're focused on how people work together. So it's a different piece, similar. This is where, what is convenient? Convenient means most people can attend. Convenient means you don't get stuck in traffic. Convenient means I can have two at the same time. So, it's not a so then you need to say, okay, my next one. Exactly. I mean, I know this group. No. Um, so then that's where, okay, my necessary condition is convenient time. time. Hopefully, the success factor is clearly defined in that implies what convenient time should mean. But if it's not, it could be just agree what convenient is. So then the yeah, but I mean, I, okay. I think it sounds quite simple, so you may not get many necessary conditions. Um, if I look at what is this right? time and place that attracts members, so you need enough space, affordable. Yeah, uh, you're going to need a time. You probably need a way of assessing if it's convenient for members. Right. So, so this is uh, one of the things that we find come very often. We can come up with what the basics are. There's a place, there's a time, it's big enough. But it also brings in, well, in terms of continual improvement, is there something I can build in here that means that should something change, everybody stops eating at six, they start eating at eight because it's the summer. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, so you get some metric that captures it. Yeah. Is it still a convenient time or has something changed? Yeah. Yeah. So this is where the, the necessary conditions is a broad, you know, it's, it's strategic. You kind of push out the boundaries. Um, you don't always have to, but at the end of the day, you choose a good time and place and everybody knows it. Yeah. That's good too. Before, before, I suggest every, before I suggest everybody comes down and sits down, is there any group that would like to tell us a little bit about what they learned, what they found in terms of success factor? Or is everybody sick of standing and just wants to sit down? This group over here before we start to disperse. <laughs> we think that group has probably got some great yeah. stuff. <laughs> they look like they're really, colors, so. yeah, I think they should share. Yes. Uh, it just seems from sort of going through the process, and you know, I don't think any of us have previously done this specific exercise. It's, uh, it, you know, it, it, it's like a lot of agile exercises, you know, when yeah. you're first doing it, it's, it's kind of quite disorganized. You're, how you're, you're putting definitions and meanings to the, the actions that you're doing. Yeah. And it seems like one of those things where it's not until you quite a number of times that it, it starts to gain a lot of clarity. Yeah, it, I, what my experience with that one has been we're cramming something in 15 minutes pretty much. Yeah. Uh, if I get an afternoon or two hours is the minimum I would normally spend, you're able to go through because it's exactly what you, you almost have to get out the stuff that's cl cluttering up our head first yeah. and then come back and revisit it and people start getting into the move, the, the, the kind of feel for it. I guess that's one of the sort of the bad habits I see in a lot of agile kind of, you know, for lack of a better word, games, you know, scrum games and card games is there's a lot of clutter. Yeah. And by the time people have really gotten all the clutter out, they're tired. Nobody really, everybody's kind of done with the process. It's a mess. People have argued about cards and there's, you know, you're, you're kind of stuck trying to clean that up to give a clear vision. So um, I, I can understand where you're coming from. Um, what I can tell you is when I've worked with leadership teams on this, the energy level goes up through the exercise. Uh, the reason being, they begin to get that view across the whole picture. 
And as they do, they get more enthusiastic because they're, all of a sudden they've got a picture that goes, oh, now I understand why this has happened and that, and they begin to see it come together. But I do agree, in, in like 15 minutes or 20 minutes, which is what we've had a chance to do, with people who are disparate, so it's a very much a touch on top, so I understand what you're talking about. But that comment that you've seen that with leadership teams, I think, speaks to the process, is that yeah. they're, they're committed to, uh, to the result, they're invested yeah. in, the, in the result. I often go through the process with work teams, as yeah. more of a better example, and they kind of feel like it's tedious, I've got to get back to work. So, yeah, it know. depends how the learning comes out. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It also depends, I guess, on who's doing the exercise. If you're in the development team, they're going to look more and more detail, yeah. which is going to drag them as the process goes on. They are going to lock down. The leadership teams, the more they do it, the higher a level of wider picture that they get. That is yeah. what's going to energize the leadership. So let's, let's grab a seat now quickly. Um, I'm just going to try and wrap up in, in a four or five slides and then open up for questions and feedback. You still need to regularly review it, update the color coding and things like this, as you would with any sort of strategic tool. Um, but the nice thing is that those individuals who get pulled away for 10 days come back, they immediately see the progress that's been made, and they can also <coughs> take action when they have time. So it was a, a very valuable kind of tool that allowed us to do that. Um, one of the other points, there's been a bit of feedback on how it's being used and so on. What we've seen, yeah, um, what we've seen a lot is if you work with the leadership teams and do this and then sort of start here with the operational team who's going to do a lot of the work, then you, because you want to kind of give them some constraints, which is probably the objective, it could be the success factors and then have these guys come up with all the necessary conditions, you can learn an awful lot. Uh, because this is where all of a sudden the operations team, say, team says something like, look, we've, all our hardware is creaking, we need to replace hardware. They have a different perspective on what's needed to deliver a success factor. And if you match that against the leadership, the leadership team and the development, the working team will often learn a lot. Uh, so, and that, that can be a very interesting exercise as well. Uh, one of the things that we avoid doing is pulling an entire backlog out. By definition, leadership teams working in this area, they're in a, a typically a very dynamic environment. So we typically only pull out enough items in a backlog that the leadership team can commit to then and there. The reason being they effectively have a prioritized backlog they can always pull from. And that's just visualizing it with some sort of workflow process. Yes? Yeah, you, you can time box leadership and time boxes struggle. No, 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 but this, all this transition and all these tasks yeah. and all these conditions, right? Yeah. You as a coach, would you say, okay, expect this to be done in this, this much time, or this is my metric, so I'm going to measure you against? Is it possible to measure? Yeah, I mean, you can, it's like anything else. If we know roughly what's going through, we can measure how long it takes for cycle time to get an item through the backlog, for example. You as a coach would yeah. come up with, this is the expected amount of time, right, for this particular task, or is it a process of, of gathering metrics? So I, uh, that's a great, okay. There's sort of two examples there. One is, as, as an agile coach coming in, having gone through this a number of times, I can certainly say, look, this should take you about this long. Uh, but then, of course, anything can happen. They could say, and your team is not going to be available for six weeks. It's going to extend it. So you can certainly go in with an agile coach's experience and say, this is what an average organization structured a bit like yours. This is how long it would take. What I much prefer, and that can certainly be good for anchoring or for, for informing leadership about what they can expect. Uh, what I'd much rather do is have this uh, backlog flowing so that I can see how, much, how many items and how long each item is sitting in the process. You will gather, somebody will gather metrics yes. based on that time, yeah. right? It is used in gathering metrics. Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. Well, it gives you predictability. I mean, Agile is all about, in some extent, is all about increasing predictability. When I say it's product owners, the reason they love it is not because they have to write everything small, but because they get predictable behavior. And, uh, yeah, so you can build that in. Okay. 
So, uh, yeah, continually reviewing and refining as you'd expect with any agile methodology is important. What we've seen is, is there's a lot of things you can do with this, going back to theory of constraints, but we won't cover too much there. But just in terms of looking at connections between things and finding out what is maybe holding one thing back uh, in, in other areas, you get a lot of transparency in terms of different parts of the organization working somehow counter to the other parts of the organization. Uh, so just in conclusion, very quickly, these four key aspects of leadership teams, of group leadership teams uh, that I talked about. The fact there's a working team versus a leadership team. That leadership teams emerge with that grinding curve with scale. Before that, you have leadership individuals more, more than likely. Um, leadership is a group, as a group activity is something that we can expect to see more and more uh, ideas about how that can work and where it makes sense. Uh, and then some of the tools that kind of constrain how we can behave together. Um, this is just a summary of what we've just gone through, which I think you've all got really good experience on at this point. So just in, in closing, and so I, I've specifically ended it about 10 minutes before. If we have any questions or you want to ask either about this or any other questions, Otherwise, I'll say thank you. So, um, you mentioned about revisiting. Yes. Do you guys ever encounter yourself in a group think situations? Group think? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, definitely. Yeah. Uh, and this, is, and I think, in, in, for example, in the Agile community, if everybody really, you can see that a lot. We all almost group together and think in the same way and look out. And I think that's something we have to watch for a lot. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a lot of literature on groupthink and how to avoid that. Diversity is probably the primary one. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? <coughs> Excellent. Everyone gets a coffee break early. So thank you very much. <coughs>